for the first time, I lead the way home. At least, I hope it's the way. I'm reasonably confident. At my side, Abigail remains quiet and lost in her thoughts. With one hand, she clings limply to my sleeve, trusting my navigation. I don't disturb her, instead concentrating on remembering the path. It's to challenge myself. I'm sure that if necessary, Abigail would be able to lead us home from anywhere. Well, I don't know. Still, I'm beginning to fear that I've led us astray when the grim walls of the church start to come into view. A mixture of relief and pride flows through me. It's also a little bittersweet. I've come to think of the church as home, even though I've never felt that way about the cabin. Despite the fact that the concept of home is just a formality now, surrounding ourselves with wall and a roof doesn't change a whole lot. Clouds are beginning to settle overhead, muting the daylight and making everything murky. It feels fitting for the mood. Abigail speeds up a bit as we reach the doors, and she's the first one inside. She sits down on one of the band benches. Fatigue. Mind if I join you? I gesture at the open spot beside her. Please do. Wordlessly, she rests her head against my shoulder. Headaches still? She nods. I'm afraid so. Our encounter there sure didn't help. I'm sure. I'm sure. They gave me a headache of sorts too. More of a notion that I can't get out of them that I can't get out of my head. The fairy's outstanding offer sits with me. As hard as I try, I can't fully push the idea away. If there isn't any other way out of this, then maybe being a fairy queen would be preferable than just being a normal ghost, as long as I could still have Abigail with me. That's the last resort though, because for as long as I can, I have to hold out hope that things can just go back to normal, that Tara and I can leave Eisenfield, Eisenfeld the same way we arrived. And that we can take Abigail with us. God, now these two fucking girls want to take take their girls from Eisenfeld with them. <laughs> Beside me, Abigail shifts her head just a little. I'm sorry, am I bothering you like this? Not at all. I wonder if she's close enough to, he to hear my heart beating. Maybe it can't always be like this. But just for now, it's alright. Oh no. <laughs> Although it's been a couple of days since we met the fairies and they made their offer, I hadn't been able to get it out of my head. The visions themselves are just slush by now, with the memories of them having eroded into non-existence. But the feelings remain, the feeling of belonging and of freedom. <laughs> That's why they want you to have a taste, you know? They want you to <sighs> hold on to that lingering feeling. There's something else I can't get out of my head, though. And she's- and she's sitting right beside me. Oh, you can't get Abigail out of, out of your head? Well, I mean... Madison, here they come. Sure enough, a mother deer and her fawn comes trapsing, tra tra trapsing out of the bushes, no doubt on their way to get a drink. Starlight and the waxing moon makes them look like ghosts at first, barely visible in the dusk. Upon entering the clearing, they see us and both freeze. Abigail smiles encouragingly, reaching a hand out towards them. After a moment's hesitation, the fawn takes one tentative step towards us, then another, and another. This one's name is Alma. Hello, Alma. I greet it in the same way I would greet my friend's dog or cat. Deciding that we're not a threat, the mother deer goes to the pond while the baby one creeps even closer. Abigail never moved towards it, never pushing too far. Then it nuzzles her hand, leaning into the soft, scratching motion of her fingers. Is this the deer that was watching you sing the other day? Most likely. Alma's a bit shy and sometimes prefers to keep her space. Did you know this deer pretty well, huh? Of course, we're very good friends. To demonstrate, she, she strokes Alma's tawny neck. She doesn't even have to sit up to do it since the fawn's face is just about level with her shoulder from where we're sitting on the ground. Alma closes her eyes, clearly enjoying the attention. Would you like to pet her? I'm certain she'd let you. Sure. I lean forward, my hand outstretched like Abigail's was, but the second I move, Alma's eyes go wide and she bounds away into the darkness. Her mother watches, alarmed, from the shoreline. Guess not. <laughs> Alma, come back. 
I promise Madison won't hurt you. She's just as sweet as you are. I'm glad for the darkness and that she won't be able to see me blush. While she's not looking, I scoot a little bit closer to Abigail. Just a bit. Just a tiny bit. The hanging fairy baubles help to illuminate the young deer who watches from a safe distance. None of the fairies themselves seems to be around though. It takes a bit with Abigail and I sitting silently, but the fawn chooses to come back after all. Her steps are still reluctant and ready to dart away at any second. She lets Abigail pet her, but watches me warily while it happens. I don't mind. I'm just content to watch and enjoy seeing how happy it makes them both. How long have you known Alma? It must have been a while for her to trust you like this. Oh yes, I've known her for her whole life. I've known her mother since she was small too. Abigail waves at the mother deer by the, don uh, by, by the pond who returns to sating, sh sating her thirst. Sating? That's amazing. I can only imagine the patience, time, and dedication it must have taken to earn the trust of the woodland creatures. Well, I mean, when you have nothing else to do. Still, all things considered, I'm not surprised that they make an exception for someone like Abigail. She exudes comfort. I'm not sure how else to, to describe it, and I'm certain I've never felt anything like it before. Maybe being close to her is just as comforting as the deer uh, for the deer as it is for me. Do you have any other animal friends that I'll get to meet? Oh, certainly. If you'd like, I'm sure Mr. Bear is asleep for the season, but perhaps once he wakes up, there's also a pack of wolves around, but for Alma's sake, that would be best left for another time. <laughs> the deer nuzzles her hand in agreement, and Abigail coos contentedly. None are quite as friendly as Alma and the rest of the deer, though. When I was a child, I wanted to have a deer as a pet. I thought that perhaps I could learn to ride one, like a horse. My sister and I would look for footprints in the snow and track them for as long as we could. Your sister? She looks at me, smiling despite the melancholy tone in her voice has taken on. We'd never got very far, of course, hardly a few feet into the forest, but to children like us, it was quite an adventure. You must miss her a lot. Abigail hardly ever mentions her family. I imagine that despite how long it's been, their memories must still be painful. She smiles thinly, in a sense. The deer is still luxuriating under her caress. Her hand moves rhythm uh, rhythmically and gently, alternating between petting and scratching Alma's neck. She relaxes a little, resting against my side, but continuing to pet the deer. More than anything, I think I miss the days of wonder and awe, back when the forest and all of its creatures were still a mystery. Sometimes I wish it could be like that again, that it could be unknown. You wish that you hadn't met them? No, not at all, at least not given the circumstances. I'm quite grateful for the companionship they've given me. For so many years, they've been one of the few sources of company I've had. But while my love for them has never diminished, I've come to the conclusion that it's grown to the most it can grow as well. That's simply what the world had become for me, a small world of knowns and nothing more. She looks away from the deer and back at me. A few tears spot her face, but she doesn't look sad. In fact, she's beaming. And then I met you, Madison. Moonlight frames her face, the lovely night sky, the fairy tale friendly deer, the ethereal woman. It's an image straight out of a painting. You were my first unknown in countless years, the first soul I could speak with that I didn't yet understand. And what a wonderful unknown you turn out to be. I'm frozen again. I've never had anyone say anything that sweet to me. How am I supposed to respond to something like that? I try to calm uh, my heart as it hammers in my chest. Looking at her soft expression only serves to accelerate its rhythm. I, uh, uh, um, thank you. That's, that's really sweet. I, I think you're wonderful too. Her free hand darts out to grab mine before I have a chance to react as her eyes widen even more, nearly startling the deer away. Do you really mean that, Madison? I really do. You're an incredible person. 
I can't imagine having to go through what you've been through without losing any sort of capacity for joy. But here you are, still so full of energy and positivity. I hope that I hope that I can maintain that sort of optimism. God, we're just having lovely moments, aren't we? Abigail lets go of the deer and flings her arms around me in a tight hug. It's a pretty awkward position because of how we're sitting together, but I don't mind. I hug her back as best as I can, my only acre in the storm of chaos that my life has become. <laughs> Indignant, Alma slicks her ear back and dart towards off the trees again. Alma's like, oh, I ain't got time for this shit, I'm out. Without letting me go, Abigail cranes her neck to watch, this time not calling the deer back. Alma's mother bounds over to join her daughter and they both go careening off. I lean my head down to rest against Abigail's in... In... Against Abigail's in what becomes... A familiar position. When did we get so comfortable with each other? Being like this just feels natural. Well, I mean, consider that she's literally the only other person you've been, uh, you've been interacting with for weeks now. <laughs> she parts from me after a moment, sitting up straight again. She totes her head up to the stars, and I gaze with her. The night is mostly clear, except for a few wispy clouds. All is still and quiet and calm. Even the pains of the forest doesn't seem to reach us here. I wouldn't call myself an optimist. I blink, surprised by her sudden words. I don't, nor have I really had much hope. There are still small comforts and delights, but those aren't the same thing as hope. I can remember names and faces, and even dreams and aspirations that I once had. But do you know what the most curious part of it is? She glances at me, and I notice tears in her eyes. Without thinking, I reach up and brush them away. No reaction. My heart pounds in my chest, nervous about something that I can't identify, or that I'm unwilling to accept, afraid to be wrong about. What is it? I can't remember how it felt for those dreams to be within reach. Even with my meager, lonely existence, there was still a chance. As unlikely as it would have been, there was always the possibility that someday, something would change, something might happen. There was a light, so to speak, to look forward to, and the day that I died, that light went out. More tears, replacing the one I wiped away, sparkle in her eyes. I move to repeat the motion bump from before, but this time, she stops my hand, holding them in her own between us. I never gave thought to what this unlife might be keeping me from. Not from the life I left behind, but whatever it is I would have met with what I had lived to the end to, to the end of my days. For a long time, I considered myself lucky that I was free from hurt and pain and worry and loss. Even if they were predictable and boring, my years here in the forest haven't been unpleasant. But I've never been optimistic. I've never had anything to look forward to. Never in my wildest dream did I imagine meeting someone as perfect as you. Never did I imagine that I would be happy again. I understand. I know what she's saying, and more importantly, what she means. A shiver runs down my spine. I feel like we're just gonna have the same scene that we had before. But Madison, I don't deserve that happiness. Not at the cost of your own. I keep thinking how if I had been a bit faster or more decisive, perhaps I could have saved you that day in the snow. And that even if not, I don't know what future I've stolen from you. I don't know what awaits those of us who pass on. All I know is this unlife and its permanence and the way and, and the way that you deserve better. She's crying now, fully. Her chest heaves into a sob, and I pull her closer to me, to me in, to, to me in, as a tight hug as I can manage. As kindly and as delicately as I can, as gently as she always treats me, I hold her and sway gently, as much as our position will allow. I can tell, just from the way she cries, that she's been holding this in for a long, long time. I let her let it all out. <laughs> Just gotta let it all out, you know? 
It must have hurt so bad to be feeling this way. I speak in a whisper. We're just getting scenes after scenes. It's not your fault at all. Don't ever blame yourself for any of this. I know I don't. Ever since we met, that day in the forest clearing, all of you've done is made things better for me. I don't know if I ever told you this, but during those first days we met you, seeing you again was all that I would look forward to. I'd go to bed thinking about you, and wake up the next morning thinking about you. And as for everything else, to be honest, I don't know how to feel about a lot of it. So much of it is just so hard to process. I thought that it would be it would get easier with time, but it hasn't. But there is one thing I know. One thing that I'm absolutely sure of. I squeeze her hands, and I see her startle. Just a bit. No matter what I'm missing out on, I'm sure I'd rather be here with you. Ah! 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 If only I could be the deer and just run away. <laughs> I mean it. Every word of it. God, the fucking sparkle and I just got it. <laughs> I've never really put too much thought into an afterlife or anything like that, but any time spent here with Abigail is time well spent. And if that means eternity, then so be it. Beside me, Abigail gazes into my eyes wondrously. Her lips move as she searches for the words she wants to say. Madison. She shivs so that the starlight caresses her face, perfect and yet not nearly as luminous as she is. May I kiss you? Whoa! Whoa, Abigail! Whoa! Hold on! <laughs> First holding hands, now kissing? Excuse me, lady. For once in my life, I don't overthink it. Yes? Her eyelids flutter and close, her breathing trembles, then steadies. I empty my head of any other thoughts. Oh, <laughs> And I press my lips to hers, so soft and so warm, as delicate as the fresh fallen snow. I thought I said flesh, I was like, well, I mean, as sweet as cotton candy. Her form shivers against me, and I place an arm around her for support and for comfort, mutually. I can feel her getting more and more confident and more relaxed as 200 years of loneliness are melted away one by one and we're left as just two souls sharing a first kiss under the night sky. Oh, how cute! <laughs> it feels so bright that after we've both been through so much sadness and loss that we're now able to share this moment of joy. Not just share it, but to be able to offer it to each other. It's our light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, When we finally part, my lips still feel electrified. She regards me with a coy expression, but a happy one. <laughs> that was even more wonderful than the many times I had imagined it. I hope it was worth the wait. I'd wait another 200 years if it was the only way I'd get to kiss you again. Damn, Abigail! <laughs> I promise you won't have to. To prove it, I lean forward and give her another quick peck on the lips. Abigail leans against my side yet again. We've done this several times, times before, times, times, but it's never felt like this. It's never felt this right. Everything feels a little bit brighter now. Did I just get a bad copy? Our next day passes blissfully. We wander the forest, seeing all of our favorite spots. The comfort of our new relationship makes the time we spend together even more joyful. Everything is prettier when I'm seeing it with Abigail besides me. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, uh, well, I guess, I, I don't know. Abigail's getting a headache and there's a whole fire shit, you know? Of course, as has become our tradition, we end up Back at the mystical fairy grove, we settle into our favorite spots by the shore with the perfect view of the pond. As much as I love films, I've never been a big fan of romantic scenes. They always feel so forced. The soaring music, the obvious atmosphere, the cheesy dialogue, they're so divorced from real life that I just can't take them seriously. But here I am, 
watching the sunlight reflect off of the shimmering water of the lake as the woman I love lean against me. <laughs> and I think that maybe those scenes weren't so unrealistic at all. Wow. Madison? What is it, sweetheart? Oh my, a sweetheart? I don't use pet names. It's not like me at all. Aw, sweetie. But with her, I feel like it fits. I know that I've said this before and will probably say it many times in the future, but today and yesterday have been some of the happiest days of my life. Mine too, and it's okay. I'll never get tired of hearing you say it. She smiles at me, as soft as ever. God, this is such happy music, even though <laughs> the current situation is so fucked. <laughs> but hidden in her expression and in her tone of voice, I can detect a tinge of sadness. I touch her face, running my thumb across her cheek. She closes her eyes and leans into an emotion. Are you feeling okay? Of course, why wouldn't I be? I don't know, you just look a bit sad. Maybe it was just my imagination. I half expect her to deny it, but instead, she nods. You do know how to read me, don't you? <laughs> I do. What's wrong? You can tell me anything, I promise. Only if you want to talk about it, of course. She <coughs> she pushes me as she pushes closer to me in response, resting her head against my chest. This day is so lovely. I don't want to say anything that could spoil it. You don't have to worry about that, Abigail. I love you, and that means I want to be there for you no matter what. We're going to have plenty of wonderful e evenings, I promise. And being open with each other is the best way to make sure they stay wonderful. This is unlike me too. Usually on the first day of a relationship, I'm still a bumbling bag of nerves. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I move too fast or too slow? But it's different with Abigail. That fear isn't there. I can't quite explain why. I just feel like I don't have to worry with her. I was thinking about other happy days that I've had. How long it's been since then, and how the memories have since soured. How much have I told you about my sister? Not much. You mentioned that the two of you were close and that you spent a lot of time in the woods together, but that's it. We weren't just close. Helena and I were inseparable. Whenever anything went wrong, she would always be there to protect me. She swore that would never change. She swore that that would never change. Okay. <laughs> But fate had other plans for the two of us. She trails off uh, every other time she's mentioned her sister. It's only in passing. Her story last night about tracking deer is the only solid detail I have about her. At first, I expect her to stay quiet like before, but instead, she keeps talking. The scene just keeps continuing. <laughs> oh, we get to know a little bit more about the curse, I suppose. For as long as it's existed, Eisenfeld has had a curse, you could call it, a terrible monster who would destroy the village if given the chance. To appease its terrible rage, we would offer a sacrifice to it. Every generation, a new offering would be chosen, but it didn't want just flesh. The head priest would take the sacrifice into the forest to be offered to the horrible spirit. The sacrifice's soul and the head priest's body would both be consumed. Then, the new head priest would emerge, having taken the form of the poor sacrificed victim. It was a painful reminder of those we had lost. When I found out that it would be a member of my family who was about to be taken and given over, I wasn't shocked. There was only one thing that I cared about. That it wouldn't be my beloved Helena who was harmed. Her voice wavers before she falls silent. Before I can tell her that's an, that she said enough, she speaks again. Each word each words shakes as it leaves her mouth. I couldn't forget the joyous days of our childhood. I couldn't let such a kind soul suffer a horrible fate. So when the time came, I offered myself. I volunteered to die so that Helena could live. And in that very moment, where our fates were sealed, I looked at them, at Helena, and do you know who I saw? Captivated by her tragic story, I can't even answer. I don't move my head or my lips. Relief. Not once did she try to stop me or change my mind. Not that I would have let her, but I don't think she even thanked me. What? Your sister is just like, oh, thank God it's not me? What? 
Yeah, I looked at Helena and you know what I saw. Relief. What in the what? Okay, anyways. My parents cried, of course, but they didn't argue either. Neither of them stepped forward to take my place. No one did. While I'm sure my sacrifice was appreciated, I was quickly discarded without even a token, without even a token effort or gesture of appreciation. My sister, who had sworn to always protect me, had no difficulty accepting the fact that I would die for her. What? She just gave you away? Like that? If death looms over you for long enough, it corrupts everything, even love. It didn't corrupt you. Perhaps, though I believe, that's why I'm still here today. I believe that, that's why. <laughs> what do you mean? The first step of the ritual involved separating the sacrifice's body from its soul. From what she told me as she did it, those poor victims usually try to resist, begging for someone else to be taken, and when their souls are ripped away, they're too damaged to carry on. But because she accepted it, uh, that hurt. But I didn't resist, I went peacefully, and so the gentle forest spirit, who I'd been raised to believe that to be was some kind of demon, eventually came back and took me away, and I've been here ever since. Her words carry a sense of finality. I feel like I just I feel like I've read that sentence before. Not knowing what else to do and still stunned by her story, I simply lean closer to her and and her pull her into an embrace. And her pull her into an embrace. Okay. And her pull her into an embrace. There are any words that could be enough. Physical comfort is all I can offer. To my surprise though, when she finally pulls away from me, she looks happier than before, just like I did earlier. She touches my cheek gently and then leans in for a kiss. Thank you for listening. I've told the one person who matters and now I think I can heal. I know, sweetheart. I love you more than anything. Oh my god. Oh, I love you too. More than anything- Ah! 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 Ah, God! She sighs contentedly and leans against my shoulder. She takes my hand and intertwines her fingers with mine. We sit there for a long time. We don't say anything. We don't even move. All we do is watch the sky and feel each other's heartbeat. Ah, oh, scene over. <laughs> I mean, technically the scene is over, but- after a while, she stretches, yawning, and lays down on her side, facing me. I do too. I can't help but smile at the sight, my own happiness mirrored in her face. The tips of our nose brush together, almost as close as we can be without actually kissing. She breathes a small, soft puff of air on my neck and a goosebump rub run up my arms. In all honesty, our relationship has been like a whirlwind, so I soak in every moment of calmness we share together. She reaches out and touches my cheeks, her hand lingering on my face. I reach up to hold it there, relaxing and enjoying the softness of her touch. Abigail moves a little bit closer and closer and closer, placing little butterfly kisses on my brow. Hey there. Why, hello. <laughs> she closes the last remaining inches between us as she presses her lips to mine. I close my eyes and the last thing I see her is doing the same thing. Our kiss is relatively chaste, just enjoying the newness of our intimacy. You know, I, I, I knew I was gonna, uh, well, I mean, I obviously I knew I was gonna hit a fucking love scene somewhere here, but I like that it gives you the option to skip, but it's also like very, it, it, it pulls you out of the game and it's like, would you like to play the adult content? <laughs> it's like a new game. I'll save it and, um, I'll save it and, uh, you won't get to see it, but you know. I get to. <laughs> Let's check out this adult content.
and then I feel her tongue press against my lip and enter my mouth as her mo as her hand moves down my back. Damn, dude, Abigail's the one who's who's making the initiative. <laughs> My eyes shoot open and I pull away just a little. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Is, is that was that too much? I just got caught up in a moment and I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable. I I just didn't want to force anything on you. You say that, but you force your tongue in her. Oh no! She tries to pull away. She tries to pull away. Her face red and guilty, but I hold on to her, keeping her near. You don't have to apologize. You just surprised me, that's all. Where'd you learn this, Abigail? I, uh, I'm not opposed to you doing that, if you're comfortable with it, I mean. Are you, are you sure? I pull her back towards me so that we're at the starting point again. I'm sure, Abigail. I've been for a while now. I know that we're from different eras and I wasn't sure how to go about Madison, her eyes are filled with a strange fire. Please, go about this any way you'd like. Oh! She's letting you have her uh, uh, away with her. She pulls me in again, wasting no time to resume our kiss, fierce and passionately. Her hands claw at my back, and I can feel them through my coat. Then she stops. She breaks the kiss, though her lips hovers just a breath away from mine. Can I admit something rather embarrassing? What, have you been practicing? <laughs> I think we're beyond embarrassment at this point. Good. Then I can admit a part of me wanted you since the first moment we touch hands. Oh, damn! Wait, are you saying that you- Madison, I'm doing my best to avoid being crude. Damn, I have a good- <laughs> But please, remember that it has been more than two- <laughs> So you're what you're telling me, Abigail, is that you're a thirsty ghost? <laughs> but please, remember that it's been more than 200 years since I last touched another human being. Okay, that's fair. You can only touch your- <laughs> You can only touch yourself for so long before it gets old. After a few thousand times, it begins to lose its luster. <laughs> Damn, Abigail. <laughs> I fucking knew it. I fucking knew giving her that soft voice was going to be wrong. I mean, she had a soft voice to begin with, but I knew it. Goddamn. I recognize that a number like that probably isn't that high for such a long period of time, but it's still such a little strange to hear. <laughs> we live in the modern age now, don't we? We get someone who does that within a year. Over time, my desires dull. I didn't feel like that need. I didn't feel that need anymore. But when I felt you. Her breath is hot on my face. Every lust-pack word is hotter. She presses her body against mine. I felt that need more intensely than I ever had before. Let me show you what I mean. <laughs> Let me show you what I mean. <laughs> Abigail guides my hand through the process of undressing her, helping her, f helping my fingers undo every bun and bow. I'm really hot. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm just gonna, uh... I'm just gonna go into a square box if you need me. Hello. This is me, square boxing time. There's no modesty. She enjoys the attention as much as I enjoy seeing her like this. Woke. <laughs> Almost. As my hand moves further upward, she moans in my ears. Please don't make me wait any longer, Madison. I've waited long enough. <laughs> I've made I've waited long enough. In all the relationships I've ever been in, I've never met someone as frank or as genuinely devoted as she is. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what? Abigail's kind of giving me flashback to fucking wolf tales. <laughs> right now, all I want to do is... Please, no. <laughs> Please, I just want to go to sleep, alright? Without responding verbally, Marori walks over to my bed and crawls on top. Oh, my worst nightmare is happening. Oh, no. I'm just gonna censor that whole thing. 
It's a good picture, though. I will say, it's a good picture, though. Lifting myself up more, I press my chest to Abigail's. Another shiver passes through me as my erect nipples brushes against hers. That's actually very nice, the way they, 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 they drew, like, both of their, both of their boobs pressing against each other. Too bad you can't see it, huh? <laughs> the instant they enter her, her eyes shoot open and her mouth form a silent cry. Inside her, I feel her walls clamp down around my fingers so tightly that I can barely move them. Fuck. <laughs> she literally just said, fuck, I fucking knew it. <laughs> I could feel her tighten up again as she arches her back, and I have no doubt that she just came, but she doesn't stop. <laughs> she keeps urging me deeper. Now it's my turn to gasp as she slides her hand up and down my vulva. Vulva, wow. In between orgasms, she simply looks up at me with a pure loving smile. God, I love you. God, <laughs> God I love you. Is that what Abigail really? <laughs> As her fingers speed up inside me, she repeats she repeats those words over and over, and she still doesn't let me stop fucking her. <laughs> My words dissolve into a long moan as I finally come harder than I ever have before. <laughs> my energy spent, I finally let my hand go still as I breathe against her shoulder. She finally lets me stop. <coughs> I slide off of her, burying my face in the crook of her neck as I catch my breath. Despite her fervor, fervor just a moment ago, she looks like she barely broke in a sweat. <laughs> She waits with a patient smile for me to regain my composure, idly playing with a lock of my hair. When I raise myself up on my arms again, she gazes upward with pure adoration and love. That was more than worth the wait. Everything about you has been worth the wait. <laughs> I could tell. And you too, you were like... I looked down at myself. The evidence, just uh, the evidence of just how good she was, still paints our bodies. I'm glad that I haven't lost my touch. <laughs> Walter Abigail. No pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. Oh, it was very intended. <laughs> we, as we snuggle up close together, she brushes my hair back from my eye. But Madison, I do just have one request. Anything for you, sweetheart? That one earns me a quick kiss on the nose. Promise me that won't be the last time. <laughs> That'll be the easiest promise for me to keep. <laughs> oh, my lord. Here we are, back at the church. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had fun, didn't we? <laughs> I wake up with a headache, and I know that something's wrong. I'm alone. Abigail must have disentangled herself from my arms at some point, leaving me on my own. I get up and pace around the church, not seeing her. After a bit, I find her outside the door. Good morning. Good morning, my love. Her lips smile, but her eyes don't. It's a look I'm pretty familiar with by now. I slip an arm around her as I take a spot by her side. Sleep okay? Well, enough. I'm sure all of my nights will be better now that they're spent beside you. I can't help it. I kiss her on the cheek. A true joy brightens her face. How about you? Pretty good. I woke up with, like, a bad feeling, though. A bad feeling? About what? I'm not sure. My head kinda hurts, so maybe that's it. Actually, now that I think about it, this is the first actual pain I've felt since turning. It's not the worst headache I've ever had, not by far, but it's enough to be annoying. It feels about the same as being dehydrated or having a slight cold. Aw, poor dear. She stands on her tiptoe to kiss my forehead. I felt the same, actually. I'd hoped that stepping outside might help, but it seems not. She rubs her temple, and I notice just how ragged her eyes look. How long have you been out here? A while. Perhaps an hour or so. I was afraid I'd wake you. Nah, I slept right through. It's not just a coincidence that we both feel sick, is it? Abigail purses her lips. Her brief silence is enough confirmation. No, I doubt it is. 
It must be something with the forest. The trees before us sway in the breeze. To me, they look the same as ever. No traces of lingering sickness or pain. You felt bad the other day too, when we first met the fairies. Was it the same thing then? Most likely, changes in the air. Something's happening and it isn't good. I think of the fairies fleeing some unseen terror. Is it Evelyn? I half expected her to shake her head. I wanted her to say no, but she nods. I think so. I don't know what she's done or why, but this all can't be coincidence. I nod, my thoughts turning to Tara and Morgan. I wish they could just get out of here, leave me to my fate and escape, let Evelyn do whatever she's doing while they're across the ocean, safe. I know that that won't happen though. Tara is not the type to back down from a fight. Except this time, I know she's hugely outmatched, even with Morgan's help. What about the forest spirit? You said it's a guardian of the woods, right? Why doesn't it stop her? I'm sure it's doing what it can, but it's just as intimately connected to the forest as the fairies are, far more than you or I. So as the forest itself weakens, so does it. War increases her brow. Is there any way we can help? Not that I know of. I can tell she's not really happy with that answer. Maybe we can think of something together. There has to be something we can do. Yes, perhaps. She looks up at me adoringly. I feel like I can't accomplish anything with you by my side. Her loving, her loving words are nearly enough to counteract the worry I feel. We've already been deaf. There's no way Avalyn can stop us. At least, not a second time. First, we just have to figure out how. Abigail slips her hand into mine, where it fits comfortably. Perhaps you'll make an optimist out of me yet, Madison. Shall we go for our walk? Absolutely. <laughs> Please, no. I'm glad that our changing relationship hasn't changed our routine. The walks around the forest keeps me grounded. They're enjoyable, but also a solemn reminder of how trapped we are here. My dreams of finding a way out hasn't disappeared or diminished at all. It's just evolved to include Abigail as well. There's just no way I'm leaving these woods without her. We chat Id idly as we stroll, enjoying the newfound comfort and intimacy that comes from being lovers rather than just friends. The pain in my head is still there, and I'm sure Abigail still suffers from hers as well, but it's easy enough to ignore in lieu of the pleasure that simply brings- that simply being together brings. Alright, you lovebirds. <laughs> Get- solve your problems before being any more lovey-dovey. We reach the edge of the fairy clearing, where we always seem to end up. Abigail is glued to my side. I wouldn't have it any other way. We're probably a little early to meet Alma, although they sometimes come by at this time. The grove is one of the easier places for the animals to come drink during winter, so it attracts all kinds of wildlife. Yeah, I've noticed all kind of tracks in the snow leading around here. She nods, pleased. But then we enter the grove itself and my blood runs cold. Oh, it's <laughs> oh no, Alma, we've known you for so long. Just ahead, lying prone on the frozen ground, is a fawn that I just know it's Alma. It's clearly dying, if not already dead. With a shriek, Abigail drops my hand. No! I could feel her anguish cut through me like a knife, visceral and burning. Dashing over, hands outstretched, she falls to her knees and presses a tender hand against his snout. Its small motion confirms that it's alive, if just barely. It leans into her, either in fear or in, recognition, or in recognition, eyes wild. No, no, what's happening to you? I move closer as well, though not as so, though not so close as to crowd them. Cr crowd them. It's literally only three people. Well, I mean, two people, plus the deer, so three. <laughs> and what I witness makes my stomach churn. Gaping wound 
per perforate the poor thing's body, staining the ground red with blood. They look like knife wounds or bite marks, but there's no visible damage or punctures. What? It's more like its body simply open up. What? <laughs> Abigail flails her hands, clearly wanting to help, but too afraid to touch it and cause it even more pain. She turns to me, teary-eyed. Madison, what do we do? I don't know what to do. I don't even know where to start. I kneel beside Abigail. The laceration covering Alma's bodies are clean and even, but varying in size. Some are minute, so small, as to be nearly <laughs> invisible. The largest is a gash that runs along the length of her torso. Oh, I'm getting hiccups again. How does this even happen? Through choking sobs, Abigail manages to answer. Magic. These are not normal injuries. It's the forest. The forest is sicker than I thought. And all of its children are hurting for it too. So we get headaches while Alma gets this. I shudder. Is it random? Could have just, just as easily been one of us lying here, bleeding out? Maybe our ghostliness is more of a blessing than I thought in this case. Though without it, we wouldn't be affected by the forest's illness at all. Leaning over, I gently stroke the deer's head. Its breathing is restless and agonized, but it seems to register my presence. My thumb brushes against a wound that I didn't notice, and I jerk my hand back while Alma groans in pain. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The deer's blood is vicious, vis viscous, <laughs> vicious, viscous, unnaturally so, and slick like motor oil. It sticks to my finger, stretching and webbing. It's neither warm or cold. It's unnervingly neutral. I, r I try to rub it off in the snow, but my finger passes through the ice and dirt, of course. My hand trembles with the disgusting feeling that it'll never be clean again. Abigail is still beside herself, wringing her hand impotently. There's nothing that either of us can do. Just sit there and wait as Alma passes in agony. But then... Tremor reverberates through the clearing. The ground shakes, and snow is rattled from the branches, and the uh, fairies' bobbles dance up and down. Abigail and I both face the forest in the direction of the sound, already knowing what's coming. Oh, it's the forest spirit. The forest spirit strides into view, as, the tree, uh, as tall as the trees, but no taller. It brushes past trees with no notice of the branches and snow that it disturbs. As it draws into the clearing, it acknowledges us with a level gaze. It's been a while since Abigail and I have been by to see it. The deer looks up at the forest spirit with pain recognition, its eyes wide, breathing shallow with pathetic relief. Abigail looks up at it too, tearfully, clearly glad to see it. The spirit looms closer, its great presence alone seeming to revitalize the air around us. My headache vanishes in an instant. The spirit stretch out one immense finger, drawing from its head to tail across the deer's mangled body. The two lock eyes, and as the spirit retracts its hand, it curls its finger inward, calling Alma to it. In one motion, the deer's eyes roll backwards as life exits its body. At the same time, its spectral form, ephemeral and perfect, rises from its corpse. Boundless as in life, it gives us one last glance, and then it springs across the fallen snow before vanishing into thin air, gone to join some spectral herd somewhere. Abigail wipes her eyes of tears and stands. She moves to the spirit's side and gently pats it. Thank you. I'm glad you came. The spirit's shoulders sag, its branching hanging low and still despite the slight breeze. I notice what looks like burn marks on its hide, where parts of its wooden skin is blackened and dark. Without a doubt, it's Evelyn's doing as well. I'm reminded of an old man putting a child to rest. Sorrow and surely pain as well weigh heavily on it. I don't know why, when she said, I reminded of an old man putting a child to rest, and I was like, why is the old man shooting the child? <laughs> like, putting a dog down? <laughs> I wonder how it knew to come. Did it feel Alma's pain? Or perhaps Abigail's? 
bearing emotional weight of an entire ecosystem. My heart aches for the spirit as well as Abigail, who seems forever hurt by her powerlessness. The spirit and I meet eyes again, and I bow my head in reverence. I don't know it well enough to speak to it like Abigail, but for Alma's sake, I'm also glad it's here. It stoops down and picks up the deer's corpse. Blood now runs freely from the injuries, somehow not clotting, and I have to look away. Without a second thought for us, the spirit turns and leaves once more, going back the way it came. Abigail and I watch it go. In all, the encounter could have, couldn't have lasted more than a minute or two. Okay. Long after the last of its footfall had faded away, Abigail and I sit in silence. What, next to the blood? I hold her close until we finally return to the church. The rest of the day passes quietly, and the earlier euphoria of our relationship being overshadowed by fear of the shifting forest. Though Abigail is never more than an arm's reach from me, and usually closer, she's nearly silent. Our headache returns not longer after leaving the ferry clearing, stronger than before. Now, some combination of pain and sorrow keeps us both quiet. At some point, I reach for her hand out of habit, and that's when it happens. My hand passes right through her as if she isn't even there. Abigail! I say the first thing that comes to mind. With a fright, she leaps up, searching for the source of my panic. Seems she didn't even feel it. Look! I reach for her hand, and once again, it passes right through. Just like when we first met, before we could even speak with each other. She understands instantly. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> it's a sad... 10 out of 10 voice acting. What happened? Are you okay? Do you feel any different? You should ask yourself that, Maddie. I don't know enough about magic to even start to guess why this is happening to her. Should we take you to the forest spirit or get you some rest or... Madison, it's not me. What? It's you. I look down at myself. Sure enough, my whole body is slightly transparent. I can see the floor of the church through myself. Well, you know what that means. Time to become the fairy queen, am I right? <laughs> so I'm assuming this is like... You know, Evelyn's way to get rid of, uh, get rid of, uh, get rid of Madison and or Abigail. Vertigo hits me and I stumble. Abigail lurches forward to catch me, but of course she isn't able to. Dread fills my heart. Please, no, not again. W what do I do? I slap my hand, a pathetic, ridiculous action. I can't even feel it. My own hand goes right through me. Shaky, Abigail stands up, holding her head. Something's happening to the forest. This must be all connected somehow. It's simply impossible otherwise. What could Evelyn be doing? I know that she has to be involved. I don't even have to ask. I have no idea, nor do I know why she's choosing now of all times to do it. Do you think the forest spirit can help us? The forest spirit is all I can think of. The only alley we the only alley? The only ally we have. At least it's a powerful one. <laughs> Abigail looks away. I'm sure the spirit was her first thought too. Perhaps we can try. You know I said that I was gonna do it once this like once they switch or at least once the scene was over, but like the scene keeps going over and I keep continuing. <laughs> And, uh, and some part of me hopes that they switch perspectives so I can end this. <laughs> Wordlessly, she heads out of the church and I follow behind her. The happiness and joy that we share so recently has evaporated entirely. I wish that life, whatever form it takes for us, could just slow down. That we could have more than a moment to rest. But I know that's impossible while Evelyn is still out there. And I know, one way or another, we're gonna have to be the ones to deal with her. But what I don't know is if we even have a chance. And then we're gonna... S oh no, it's still the same fucking... Okay. <laughs> I was like, well, I mean, that's a perfect time to switch perspective. 
I'm gonna end this here. <laughs> I'm gonna end this here. I've I've recorded more than I should. It's been like two hours, and my throat just is just absolutely obliterated. <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna save at this point. Flame and tinder, disappear and flicker. Okay, okay, we're hanging off. We're hanging off. I don't want to listen to that fucking sad soundtrack. <laughs> Oh, okay. So I'm assuming I'm 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 probably gonna split this into two parts. So this is probably gonna be like part eleven <laughs> of Heart of the Woods. But wow. So so yeah, we had like we literally had two scenes of confession. We had Tara and Morgan confessing their love to each other, but we also um we also had like the beginning. Well, like the beginning of the end <laughs> of where uh, Evelyn takes Morgan out and she ends up burning the forest spirit, which, uh, yeah, she ends up burning the forest spirits, which, which is now meddling with, with Maddie because that's causing, that, that seems to be causing Maddie to fucking flicker and disappear and all that. <laughs> Uh, I'm just, I, I, I was just, I was just, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about that love scene that they had. <laughs> uh, I really, I, I, I really did like that, uh, love scene though. You know, I, I, I thought it was nice. I thought it had like a good amount of like love, but also lust, especially for Abigail who hasn't, <laughs> it's been centuries. <laughs> so I, I really like that scene. But going back to going back to where I was talking about, things are just continue to happen, and I currently don't really know the timeline. Like I thought they had only a few days left, but it feels like it's been several days. Anyway, so we're we're slowly getting to like the sacrifice of Morian being sacrificed to Evelyn, and because Evelyn knows that. Abigail and Maddie is still around. I'm assuming that this is her way of trying to get rid of them by just burning the fucking forest spirit. For some reason, I thought for sure that Tara and Morgan was going to have a uh, 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 an, an H scene of their own, but I also realized that they kind of, I, I, like they kind of already had sex. So maybe we'll see. Maybe we will see one later on. But, you know, <laughs> I'm tired. I'm hungry. It's been two hours of just nonstop talking. So I'm just going to end this here. <laughs> I feel very drained. <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys for watching this. And uh, yeah, check out my social media and also my discord if you guys want to talk to me directly or with other people as well, you know, no problem. Hopefully the next part will be the last one. I'm it's going to be, I'm assuming we're, you know, like by the time I start recording again, it's just going to be the end. So hopefully I can get like a, a big recording and hopefully the end is not like right after this. All right. <laughs> I don't know, I'm assuming we may we may just have like at least an hour, another hour to go. I'll never know. So I'm not even gonna say goodbye. Oh wait, no, I just said it. Fuck.